Welcome to the Word Camping with Why Not Wander podcast. Today we're here with one of our most favorite work camping employers from Silver Lake, Michigan. This is Don, and he has Silver Lake Resort and Campground. Matt's totally sporting some merch from their store. <laughs> so we are so excited to have you on today, Don. Thanks. I'm excited. As far as people um, between you and Sarah, the owners, and Joe and Tammy, your managers, you guys are the best people we've probably ever worked for. And, and we really miss you guys and are excited about this podcast. We like them so much that we went back last summer just to see them. So having you guys was, I don't know, you, you have different relationships with, you know, I, there's 22 people a summer. So and uh, some people are just drawn to each other. I think you, I don't know, you guys just rock. I don't know. You, you know, all the conversations we've had. Uh, and I, I remember Lori talking about this concept in the, in the midst of making jewelry for my girls and how <laughs> fun that was and um, all these ideas and to see your following and social network and platforms and, the, your content, your content's amazing. So, um, but yeah, on a personal level, like you guys are the best. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I miss you. you too. Well, thank you. Yeah. So tell us about your, your resort, your campground. Um, give us maybe your location, how long you've owned it. Um, so 2005. So I think this is our 20th summer. Uh, we've had work camping since that first year, and um, not a whole lot was here. I think I've talked to you guys before. Uh, it was really uh, bare bones. Have put all all of our investment back into it for twenty years, and now it's starting to pay back, which is fun. It's it's always been good to us, but probably more so in the last few years, it's been exciting. But yeah, 30 acres, 230 plus sites, 18 cabins, uh, pretty, you know, not your mega park, uh, but, you know, a RV uh, friendly and uh, nice amenities if you've got the right people cleaning them. And uh, I don't know, I, you know, it's a night, I feel like it's, uh, it's not a finished project but it's close it's very very close so that's awesome it's very welcoming and very family fun i think a lot of fun for families but cozy i love it just feels homey to yep. come there a lot of your guests feel that way too tell us about the surrounding area what is the draw to your campground because i think that's important for you to share with everyone sure so silver lake is uh you can offer oh so it's two thousand acres of sand. We're a mile from that and a mile from uh all sports lake, Silver Lake, uh notably branded for being Silver Lake Sand Dunes. And it's the only place I believe still east of the Mississippi where you can off road on a third of those dunes. Hmm. Uh makes it highly unique. And, you know, it's just a little four mile stretch of town, three hotels. I think there's eight or nine parks now in that four mile stretch. Some of the most camping I think you'll find in Michigan in that short of a distance. And it brings in at least a million plus visitors in that eight to 10 weeks. So, um, and then we're close to Lake Michigan, the little Sable Point Lighthouse. So I, think, I mean, it just, a, there's a lot to do. What do you love most about owning Silver Lake Resort and Campground? Obviously the relationships. A lot of, you know, people come through the door, but there's a lot of loyal customers we have. And as well as making their vacation, making someone's vacation. So we're, we're a big part in believing being part of their experience, whether here, so from a hospitality standpoint, seeing them wear the Macwoods Dune Ride sticker and saying they had such a good time and you were part of planning out there for, you know, four day weekend, uh, that there is a lot of joy in that. So, and, and obviously selfishly for Sarah and I and the girls, our, our girls are younger. 
is the flexibility it gives us in the off season. That's a big one. Yeah, that's awesome. We can attest to the hospitality. You guys are the first place we've ever worked where you treated your work campers absolutely wonderful. Like um, the guests. Like the guests. I mean, <laughs> you you did events with us. You took us on a dune ride, uh, all expenses covered by you guys. Uh, you even took us to uh, a meeting room and did a hospitality training with us that was fun. Uh, you really got to know each one of us individually. So for any future work campers out there that might be watching this podcast, Don and Sarah really know how to treat uh, their workers and uh, they're just wonderful people. So we, we can attest to that. I, I appreciate that. It, that takes That takes a long time to learn. Uh, we were not the best leaders, maybe even say 15 years ago or arguably maybe even a decade ago, not our best. So you, uh, you hit us at the right time. <laughs> well, we're glad we did. So, so let me ask yeah. you the opposite. What is the most challenging part of owning a campground? Uh, hiring people like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> The, well, honestly, the most challenging is is uh, is the team, right? You have to start not all over every year, but our attrition for return employees is low, and I think that's just it. That's expected, right? You're in a program. We have a few different programs. We have work campers, we have a hospitality internship, and then we have a lot of high schoolers or locals. And in work camping, I don't anticipate return because I would expect th that program to travel the country. Um, I think that's why most people do it. So we're lucky when we get some return, but with the hardest part being just rehiring again, retraining, uh, just because you write it down doesn't give you good culture. You have to constantly have those one-on-ones, get to know what makes people tick. Uh, build the relationships and you have to build the relationships quickly. Like in a short amount of time, I got to try to get to know and Sarah as well, 20, 20 new faces almost every year. So that, that is the most challenging. And, and unfortunately like any team, sports team, corporate team, um, it, it doesn't always work with all 20 people. Uh, so there are people that, you know, uh, there are a lot of, a, a lot of people here get on the bus, get in the seat. And then there's just a few that usually get off the bus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We do our best. Yeah. And I think you said, if I heard you correctly from your opening that you've been using work campers from the start. Yeah, we had them, uh, Oh five, late 2005. We had our first couple, only couple that there was. We only had three employees when we first started. And uh, yeah, so we started. It was very rough. We didn't know what we were doing. I didn't come out of that industry. Yeah, so since then, to your point about training and culture, when we left corporate, leaving corporate was a lot of that was uh, we left because of ethics and, and corporate culture not being positive. So that was something we've always focused on since day one. It's just a little bit more polished now. It's very important, very important. So when you're hiring work campers, what are you looking for? How do you know when you're interviewing that they're gonna be a good fit for your campground? Someone that cleans and doesn't complain. <laughs> Simple as that, huh? So I'm just... <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. So. I, uh, you know, I think with my work camp, when I, when I'm recruiting our work camp team and most of our teams, I'm looking less for experience and more for kindness. So if I can feel like my interview questions are very targeted and getting the, the couple or single or whoever that might be to share as much about themselves, that's not in front of me on paper. And, and, and I listen to my gut. So if I feel like, because the job itself is not complicated, it's more so will they be a good fit to the team and will they, you know, have the culture friendly, cleanly, 
friendliness, cleanliness, and, and good service. So uh, ultimately, that's what I look for. I don't need an eight-page resume or all the things. I mean, those are great. I mean, those depends on what you're looking for. If somebody's looking for more like maintenance and things like that, then, you know, it is still nice to have on the resume to see that. But it's not my first thing to look for. Yeah. So basically, um, are they kind? Are they really good at interacting with your guests? Um, but then they're also totally happy to put in a day's work. Yeah. So I look at that. All parks are different, right? So the way I view it is you're either uh, close to retirement or retired, or maybe you're 30 years into your career and you're like, I'm getting on the road and I'm going to do this lifestyle. So I look more to um, work not being the most important. As a small family business, I feel like we've tried to change and push ourselves um, change the workload and the job around people not doing too much. I think the old adage of how I grew up and being punished and well, not punished, but like just work was like a badge of honor. And unless your knuckles were bleeding and you were, you know, um, I, I think that the world is changing and that's probably for the better. Other than that's how you still work. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there's not a lot of mats in the world, though. <laughs> and I will say it all depends. I feel like what the park is looking for. Uh, Matt, you did a ton when you were here for us that I normally would not give. I, I wouldn't say that was the normal, um, but but a huge but a huge asset when you're when you could work that physical. Well, thank you. And to, to your credit, you also asked me if I was uh, interested or willing to um, work extra hours. You didn't force. You didn't say, hey, go do this. You basically said, hey, if, if you'd like to work some extra hours, we could use you. And uh, that's awesome. A lot of other resorts and campgrounds we've been to, you don't have that option. They just tell you what to do. So you kind of create that culture. And I, I give you credit for that. So aside from the physical work that your work campers do, uh, how else do they play a role in the success of Silver Lake Campground or Resort, RV Resort? Some of them struggle with it, right? Because of uh, such a huge part of their role, so to speak, is uh, guest interaction. To answer that question directly is just uh, our guest interaction. Work campers play a huge, huge role in that, on um, checking in on you after you check in, having conversations. Uh, we have a hospitality bubble practice, which is more from the hotel market, but we use it here and, and it's gotten better and better every year. So proud of that. And work campers, because most campers, Decisions are made in the household by uh, a woman still, and they look for two things when traveling. And, and number one is, is the area safe? Number two, is it clean? Uh, are, the, are the hotel rooms clean? Is it notably known for being clean and friendly? Uh, and they're, and guests, guests go to work campers before they go to anybody else because they're the ones out there cleaning and I think they play a huge, huge role in our guest feedback. And I, I think you, you see that in our reviews and comments. I would, say, I would say a majority of that comes from our work camp team. That's really cool. I didn't know that, but that's neat. If you're like us, you might be dreaming about full-time RV life, but feeling like it could never happen for you. If you'd like to receive our three secrets to becoming a full-time RVer ASAP, go to whynotwonder.com forward slash secrets and enter your email address and we will send it right to your inbox. What is your favorite thing about work campers? They're passionate for camping. So I feel like there's just, there's an, uh, right away, there's a bonding moment they have with with our guests because they love camping. So when they can help a family out or show someone how to start a campfire or 
help them explain to them how to use their rig in so many ways. I don't know. I'd have to say the relationships that I've made and Sarah and I've made over the years, uh, there's some pretty, some pretty fascinating people. Some of them are a little different, but I'm okay with that. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it's okay to be completely honest with this next question. This is what we're looking for. And we want to up the game in the work camper circle. So what is your least favorite thing about work campers? And it, and it, you can, like I said, be completely honest and explain your answer. Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I know it's gone almost too far. So you oftentimes get uh, older uh, work campers, although that is shifting. Lately, I'm starting to get younger. By younger, I mean maybe Generation X and down, which is like 50 and, you know, so um, boomer generation. I think the biggest struggle I have with people that had uh, a, a corporate background or an extensive career is they don't shelf that and take a step back. So we have a whole acronym that you guys learned when you were here. We still employ it. It works very well, and the acronym is TEAM, and when the team falls apart, it's when people start tattling, evaluating, and managing each other, and not letting us do that. Uh, work campers by far, more so in the boomer segment, really cannot stop the habits of tattling, evaluating, and managing other team members. That creates a lot of problems. It's really hard to train you know, an old dog, new tricks, basically. So um, I would say that's my hardest over, you know, working with uh, Gen Z in the younger market, more so in our internship program, they just all love each other and could care less what's happening. Uh, so just, just a total different type way of, of being, you know, brought up. And uh, so that's our number one challenge. Uh, number two would be that uh, we pay for all hours worked and then we include everything and always have, uh, meaning, you know, the sewer, the electric, the laundry, all those things. And there is an inherent, uh, sometimes they're not as grateful for what that actual cost is. So, and I hear this banter right now on some work camper pages I follow, and I find it interesting. I feel like there should be more value for work campers in terms of pay and some of those things. And I'm glad that the 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 program the the people in the program have pushed back. Like I need to get compensated a little more. So I I a thousand percent agree with that. But now. Instead of a happy median, it's just like the park owes them exponential amount to, to work there. And they and they I see some comparisons to how much the site alone should be generating. Well, if you were to add up all the compensation, it's pretty significant. Like our work camp program is by far our highest labor expense. So um, it's not as inexpensive, I think that some people do some quick math to. That's interesting. So based on that, just out of curiosity, so is it because of you losing on the site cost for the sites that you give the work campers? Is it more than that? I just think it's so helpful for work campers to understand this side of it. That's one of the reasons we were so excited to talk to you about all of this, because we totally want to bring light to the side of the employers because we do see a lot of this entitlement like we deserve this this and this but there's not an understanding from your side of what you guys are giving us you know so it's very helpful to know what all it it encompasses yeah i, th I think it's just perception uh some of the i try not to do a whole lot of facebook uh debate because it just never usually has any type of uh, solution-based outcome. It's just banter, banter. And 
what I'm seeing is they're comparing it to your point, Lori, of uh, just the revenue it would potentially make. Well, mm -hmm. the point I would have as a rebuttal is yes, if I were running it, but it's very valuable to have a work camp program. Um, but it's not necessarily lower than paying somebody local $20 an hour because there's that that slice of property, and I think you find this out west and some other parks where it's high demand, that is, a, it is impossible to put a price tag on that sliver of land. So um, to say it's just comparison to the revenue you'd make, well, what's the value of being one mile from, you know, 2,000 acres of sand dunes where a million people want to visit every year? So to me, to put a number on that, that number kind of is exponentially larger than comparing it to the revenue it would make. Um, that doesn't mean I don't value the, that program is super valuable. Um, but as opposed to someone that comes in and goes home, the same is true for our hospitality internship program. We have a five bedroom house Well, that five bedroom house costs a lot of money. Uh, it's, it's in a great location. It's got electrical cost. It's got, there is a lot of expense to housing that I think now a little different with work campers, right? Cause they're bringing their house. Um, but yeah, there's still some utility cost and things of that nature. So I just think it, I just think the answer's in the middle. I don't think, you know, I like the movement of pushing back on parks paying, but at the same time, I think they're pushing too far to not be so grateful for that. That actually is pretty costly. So good to know. So that's another great question when you were talking about that. Why do you hire work campers and not just hire locals for 20 an hour? Well, for one, it's a struggle. You can't find them, right? So you can give that example, but it, you know, if people aren't coming to work, it doesn't matter what I put out hourly, they're just not there. So that makes okay. work camping very valuable um, in, in our industry. It, you know, some... I think Amazon's tried to use it, still does. So there's some corporate overlap, but mostly RV parks, uh, state parks, things of that nature. Um, it's a great program. It's it's a good asset for us to use. As far as your work camp, your uh, hiring process, what are the deal breakers for you when hiring work campers? Okay, it's hard to pinpoint, but I look for two egocentric personalities over the phone. So the reason I've never done in person or video is on the phone. If I can get you talking about yourself and I have this heavy, heavy sense of ego, I'm going to back away because you're, you're not going to play it as a, you might be a good leader in some ways, but not a good teammate. That's cool. That's good information. I like to ask them what they like. So one of my favorite questions is, uh, you know, pick any one of your places of employment and what did you like the most when you were there? And then on the flip side, what was the thing that you liked the least? What was the one thing you went to work and you're like, you know what? If I never have to do that again, I'm all set. And people really like to tell you what they hated. And if that in any way, I can hear a story of how they interacted with a manager that wasn't like how they thought it should have been done. And I've talked to some people that, you know, are very opinionated about how something should be done. And then you could get a good sense that they're just not going to play along. So, well, let me ask you this, because that's, it's funny, but if you had somebody who maybe you made a mistake over the interview process and they showed up at your campground and 
you discovered that they actually were more of that person. They were trying to tell Don and Sarah how to run their campground and what they should be doing correctly. I mean, how do you handle a situation like that? Or the, the they're looking out their RV window to watch all the other workers to make sure they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing. How do you handle those tensions? You can't in a lot of ways. So, I mean, I'm just going to be as transparent as you can. So we have let people go when I say our, like, we have a big responsibility and job. The entire team is get them on the bus, get them in the right seats. And the ones I do this, and that's from uh, Nick Saban uh, coach uh, that says that a lot for Alabama. And we do the same thing here. Um, we'll give, I tend to be more patient than I should be on um, giving them a chance. And, and then, and then you weigh out, okay, is it so bad that the team will fall apart and we can do it without them? Or can we get them through the team's okay as a whole, like 90% and, 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 and we're not putting too much strain on the other 10, you know, work campers. If we were a year round company, I would let that person go right away and recruit again. When you are 10 weeks, sometimes you do drop your expectations and try to roll with it. As long as it's not decimating the rest of the team. Uh, that is a hard balance. And that is something I struggle with when, uh, because of the seasonal part, it's just such a fast, I mean, it starts and then it's over. So sometimes you're like, you know what, we got a month. I think we can get through this and they're doing enough. And the customer, do now, the, if the, if it's affecting the guest and the team is being decimated, then that's non-negotiable. It just, we, we have to cut ties. A little bit of a kind of a different thing when you're when your season is so short so if anybody tells you they're yeah. not doing that i would not believe them <laughs> all right so off of that um, do you have any funny stories uh about your experience with with past work campers yeah there's i'll i'll try to pick just a couple uh, one of our favorites is we had, uh, so everybody has radios, right? And we do radio etiquette training. And one year we're like, we need some codes for emergencies and whatnot. And, and we, we launched these codes and I'll never forget Pete got on there one day and was like, you know, code red, code red, which is like the utmost emergency. That's all we put everything into play. Ambulance are coming the whole nine yards. And it was, it's, it was literally like a, a plug toilet. Uh, it was just like, but it sent the entire team into a frenzy. And it was just, it was a disaster. So we no longer do codes. We have a different, different type of system for all that. I don't do codes. Another one of my favorites is, have you ever read the book, uh, Don't Sweat the Toothpaste? Or Don't Sweat the Small Stuff? Yes, years ago. Yeah, okay, so it's been around forever. Well, in our training, we have Don't Sweat the Toothpaste. And that comes from a story of, I had a work camper one year, 6'5", just, just a massive person, uh, but, but just a big teddy bear. And I remember he, he got done cleaning the mirrors in the bathroom. And this little kid, he probably was seven, six or seven, came in, brushed his teeth, and just spit toothpaste all over the mirror. And I I seriously thought this 6'5", 280 giant was going to strangle a seven-year-old. <laughs> and had to talk Kurt off a ledge. I'm like, he's seven. It's okay. This, we, so it's just a good reminder. Like, you know, don't let him win. We just keep going in and doing it and doing it. And, but that this is all awesome, funny story that I tell and that, you know, we just constantly tell our team, like, don't sweat the toothpaste. That's funny. I remember, or we remember the whole time working there, that became something we, we would, would say we to would each say, other. Don't sweat the toothpaste because we heard you 
we heard you say that so many times. <laughs> well, I mean, even when you guys were here, we still, our training's changed, actually. We've, we've updated our manual. We've added some things. We've streamlined some things. Our presentation's a little different, but you know, it come when the policy section comes, I notice a lot of work campers will, uh, they're either very black and white mindset, and then you have a few that can, you know, deal with the gray of things, but most are pretty perfectionist and black and white. You're breaking the rules and that's just how it is. And, and it, training those people, my wife being one of them, you know, I would never do that is never expect others to act as you would reminding our team of that and then you know is it safe and is it infringing on someone else and there are so many rules that are broken every day uh that aren't necessarily infringing on anyone and and aren't horribly unsafe so you know we try to yeah like it just goes back to like people are on vacation if you sweat all the small stuff like they won't have a good time you won't have a good time uh and and i think the whole point of work camping is actually less work and more travel and fun and i think i think that's why i envy the program so much is let's get back to a you know four day work week and let's just all relax a little yeah, and you guys do a really good job of sharing that expectation with your workers as far as following the rules. Kind of like the don't sweat toothpaste, it's the same type of uh, attitude towards some of the rules. Not all of them. Some are important, and if somebody's going to get hurt, that's obviously something we're going to take care of while we're working for you. But you were really clear about that. Um, if it's a little rule and they're not going to, and nobody's going to get hurt. You know, don't make a big deal out of it. That's a hard environment for some people. Uh, Sarah owns it, and it's extremely hard. I, I would say she's come a long way. She understands that, and there's a line, right? I mean, there's, there's a line where people go too far, but most most people are pretty decent. So as we're winding down, um, as a whole, what can work campers do better? Is there anything they can do better from your perspective? I think they could practice a little bit more gratefulness um, that they're not sick, they're healthy enough to do this lifestyle. Somebody's awkwardly letting them live in their backyard for Nothing. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, uh, I just think a, a, a better overall practice of gratefulness and then not trying to manage the rest of the team unless they're being hired to do so. I would say that's the number one problem is letting their career go, knowing that they were good leaders and had a good career, but just taking a step back and playing your role and being a good teammate, that's a thats a big deal. What are you most excited about for the future with Silver Lake Resort and Campground? I'm most excited to be done with development. I, I would, I feel like we're maybe five years at the most away from total capital improvement there's always things to improve so we'll always do something so you know there's a there's just a few last things of beautification and uh i'll be excited for that when it's just running the park <laughs> so you have the cleanest bathrooms ever and we want everyone to know that whether you're a work camper <laughs> listening to this or just somebody who's going to go visit Silver Lake Resort and Campground, truly like the nicest campground bathrooms we have ever seen or cleaned. And I think that's really important because like you said at the beginning of the, the interview, that is what we as women are looking for. And I think that's important from a work camping perspective. You have made our job or you did make our job so much easier by the way those bathrooms were designed, all of it, just super, super good. So where can we come stay with you 
Uh, tell us where Silver Lake is and tell us how we can find you online. Uh, so the easiest, we know we're doing 80 some percent online bookings. So we open May 18th, close September 30th. And uh, Silver Lake RC Resort and Camp dot com, Silver Lake RC dot com. And from there, it's pretty easy to find the reservation page. Great. And we can find you on Facebook and Instagram. Any other social platforms? Uh, I would say those are the, the largest ones. We have a small Pinterest uh, page. So I would say predominantly Facebook and Instagram. Google reviews is a good way to not take our word for it. Go read about. Uh, just skip over the disgruntled ones. They did something wrong. <laughs> while we're on that topic though, is looking at Google reviews for the places you're going to work. So just a tip to add on for that. That's. Yeah, absolutely. And your reviews are outstanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I, I point so many people to that because I'm very biased. So go read. And uh, I think when you look at the keywords that are pulled out in our Facebook trip advisor and Google, is exactly our culture of clean, friendly, and good service. Three basic things. Well, Don, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day. Uh, tell Sarah that we are sorry she couldn't join us today. Uh, we just can't thank you enough for how you have treated us and how you treat your work campers and for today, just for being a part of this podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Work Camping with Why Not Wander podcast. You can see today's show notes at whynotwander.com forward slash podcast. And if you haven't done so already, please sign up to receive regular updates from us along with special discounts at whynotwander.com forward slash updates.